All right, so welcome uh, back, uh, uh, everyone. Uh, we are uh, delighted uh, to have our second keynote for this uh, workshop uh, uh, now, and, and, and we, we're very honored to welcome uh, Janet Carey. Um, uh, Janet is uh, the Henry uh, Putnam Professor of Economics and Public Affairs at Princeton University and the co-director of the Princeton Center for Health and Wellbeing. Uh, she is also the co-director of uh, the program on families and children at the NBER, a member of the National Academy of Science, the National Academy of Medicine, and the American Academy of Art and Science. She was named a Nomis Distinguished Scientist in 2019 and was named one of the top 10 women in economics um, by the World Economic Forum back in July 2015. Uh, she has also served as the president of the American Society of Health Economics, Society of Labor Economics and the Eastern Economics Association as and as the Vice President of uh, the American Economic Association. Uh, Janet is, uh, is a pioneer uh, in the economics analysis of child development and her current research focuses on socioeconomic differences in uh, health and access to healthcare in that environmental um, threat to, to health and the importance, uh, the important role of mental health and the long run impact of health problems in pregnancy and early childhood. So we are very honored to have you uh, today. Uh, you have one hour and uh, Janet agreed to take questions as we go along. And I will also either monitor the chat uh, for you, Janet, if that's okay. But uh, I think that we prefer uh, if, if you have a question or, or a comment, just unmute yourself and, and ask, ask away. So thank you very much, Janet, for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, and I, I've really enjoyed the conference so far. The um, I think quite a few of the papers, and maybe one of the themes of the conference is about distributional consequences of environmental policy. So I will try and add to that discussion that's already going on. Uh, the, the motivation is really the concern about environmental justice, which has been voiced starting uh, with some US studies in the 1980s. And two of the key studies were this 1983 US General Accounting Office study. These are commissioned by Congress when they're interested in something, which found that hazardous waste sites were more likely to be located in minority communities. And then a private effort from the United Church of Christ in 1987 put out a report called Toxic Wastes and Race in the United States that found that race was one of the most important correlates. And I'm just going to show you a map from that report, which I think is, is remarkably sophisticated. So this is a map of Chicago, Illinois, a Cook County, one county. And it's looking at the zip codes and the ones that are shaded darker are ones that have a higher black population. And then they just have the number of hazardous waste sites in each of these zip codes. So it kind of makes the point that they tend to be uh, more heavily concentrated on the south side of Chicago, which is the um, area which has higher black population, but the correlation isn't you know, perfect. Um, one reason for showing you this is it shows that looking with in a county is really useful when you're trying to look at the geo, uh, sort of racial distribution of pollution because the population is not evenly distributed by race across the county. So there's a lot of studies that find that poor and minority people are more likely to be exposed to various types of pollution. The, there was this initial focus on hazardous waste sites and that's really been extensively explored. There's a whole other literature about facilities that emit toxics uh, and um, more generally looking at who gets exposed to air pollution, who gets exposed to traffic, who gets exposed to lead uh, from either lead paint or from gasoline. And then, you know, it's such a large literature, there's several really excellent surveys of it as well. There's also increasing focus on international environmental justice issues, such, such as looking at climate-related disaster losses. So the UN um, agency 
that looks at this says that the losses as a percent of GDP are going to be four times greater in low-income countries. We saw in, in Simon's maps yesterday that sea level rise was generally higher for poorer countries as well, although uh, Great Britain was kind of an outlier. And there's also discussion of the movement of dirty industries and hazardous waste from rich to poor countries, things like battery recycling. So why do we care about this differential exposure to pollution? One uh, big reason is that it has well-documented effects on all kinds of things. Uh, so we know that it leads to higher risk of death, especially for infants and the elderly. There's the negative effects on survivors, especially surviving infants. Increases in hospitalizations, so there's a burden uh, in terms of that. Reductions in cognitive ability and labor productivity, and also negative effects on property values. Uh, and then we just saw another potential consequence, which was on the uh, public finance aspect of local communities. So um, just as an example from this really extensive literature, this paper by Eisen Walker and Rosen Slater uh, used variation from the Clean Air Act um, that we heard a little bit about yesterday and I'm going to talk more about today to sh show that the uh, counties where they were required to clean up because they were below the standard, people who were born into those counties and lived there as young children have higher earnings later on in their 30s than people who were born in counties just above the threshold that didn't have to clean up. So what this graph is showing is you get a big reduction in the fraction of people with um, you know, zero earnings, the people in the lowest earnings percentile. And where do they move? They move up to the, you know, sort of the, the middle of the earnings distribution. Um, so this is actually a fairly consistent finding in the literature on this, which is that a big part of the effect on labor force participation and earnings comes from the reduction of disability, so people who can't uh, work at all. Another example is from my work with Reed on Easy Pass. And so here we were looking at people who lived along a roadway, and some of them happened to live near toll plazas and others live further away from the toll plaza along the same busy road. So they're all exposed to the same amount of cars. But the people at the toll plaza had the additional problem of the cars slowing down, idling, and producing lots of pollution around the plazas. So when they implemented electronic toll collection, the traffic could just zip through, and then everybody's exposed to the same amount of pollution. So you can see that there's sort of an underlying trend to have increases in, in prematurity in the US more generally, but um, after easy pass implementation, you see this big reduction in premature birth for the people who are living really close to the toll plaza and had the reduction in pollution. So if pollution is a source of inequality and poor and minority people are consistently exposed to, uh, sorry, I said that wrong, but if, if uh, poor and minority people are consistently exposed to higher levels of pollution, then it could cause inequality in the form of persistent disadvantage. So we saw yesterday, for example, that these effects could even persist across generations. So we know that disadvantaged groups tend to have higher infant mortality, lower life expectancy, lower wages, and less wealth. And those are all areas which have been shown to be affected by pollution. So that suggests that these differential exposures could be contributing to these differences. So, you know, what can be done about this? In the U.S., President Clinton issued an executive order in 1994, which ordered the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to pay attention to environmental justice. Uh, they came up with the following definition of what that means. 
that fair treatment means that no group of people should bear a disproportionate share of the negative environmental consequences resulting from industrial, governmental, and commercial operations or policies. Uh, so clearly that's aspirational. And then the Aarhus Convention, um, which most European countries have, have subscribed to, takes a somewhat different rights-based approach and says that policy should protect the right of every person of present and future generations to live in an environment adequate to his or her health and well-being. That's a little bit broader. So the question um, that I'm going to address with a specific example is whether policy aimed at improving the environment more generally also addresses environmental justice. And um, the intuition for why you might think it does is really simple, which is that if poor minority people are more likely to be exposed to pollution, then lowering pollution should benefit them disproportionately and therefore improve environmental justice. So I'm going to talk about this um, in the context of this paper that with Reed Walker and John Borges uh, looking at racial disparities in particulate exposure. Can I ask a question before before you start? Just in terms of uh, uh, you know, you mentioned that some 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 population are more exposed, and I was wondering why uh, that's the case. Is that because their preferences are different, or is it really you know they they have no other choice? Uh, and do we know anything about that? So I'm gonna try and talk a little bit about the mechanisms as we go along, but that is a really important question because depending on why, you know, different policies might or might not be effective. Um, so let's hold that thought for a minute and I, and I will definitely come back to it. Okay, so in this paper, what we do is to match national pollution data at the one kilometer by one kilometer level to individual level data from the US Census. Uh, and then we're going to use that to document changes in racial gaps and exposure to PM 2.5. And we show that these gaps decreased dramatically between 2000 and 2015. And then we're going to look uh, at the mechanisms underlying these trends. So two of the uh, important ones are potentially mobility and secondly environmental policy. So just to give you an overview of the findings, what we're going to show is that much of this racial gap is attributable to the places where African Americans live because the U.S. is very residentially segregated. The tightening of air quality standards under the Clean Air Act can explain much of the reduction in the gap because the places that were dirtiest and most impacted by these changes were disproportionately African American. So we show that over 60% of the decline in the gap in exposure between 2000 and 2015 can be explained by changes in the enforcement of the Clean Air Act. And the flip side that I'll show you is not very much of it can be explained by mobility changes. And in fact, the mobility changes tend to work against the closing of the gap. So relative to, to some of the previous literature, I think the one contribution here is to use better data. So there are a, you know, a lot of previous studies looking at single cities or communities that are near toxic plants or pollution monitors. So this one kilometer by one kilometer data allows for higher resolution measurement and then the merge with the individual level confidential census data allows us to further look at mechanisms by controlling for important characteristics such as income and education, right? So you might think, well, if black people are poorer on average than white people, which they are, maybe that affects the kinds of areas that they can buy into and then the amount of pollution that they're exposed to. So we can control for that and see how much of that explains. The second contribution is this focus on the distributional effects of environmental policy. So there's a lot of literature looking at average effects of the Clean Air Act, but we're going to look at the whole distribution 
and see how that changes. And in order to do that, we use unconditional quantile regression combined uh, with these spatially continuous PM 2.5 measures. So um, this is sort of an ambitious outline given the time, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the environmental justice literature and the Clean Air Act, uh, talk about the limitations on the past data and the new data, show you the racial trends in ambient pollution exposure, and then decompose those to say how much of them are due to observable characteristics of people. Uh, then we're going to talk about the Clean Air Act change. I'm going to show you a difference in difference uh, of the impact of the Clean Air Act at different quantiles of the distribution. And then we're going to put all that together to try and say how much the policy change affected the racial gap in pollution exposure. Okay, so um, by way of background, and we, we're talking about this a little bit in the discussion after we announced very nice paper, you know, there's several different approaches to talking about environmental justice. One is to emphasize household sorting. A uh, second one is to emphasize discrimination and, and segregation in housing markets. And then the third one is to talk about the political economy aspects. You know, why do dirty industries get located in some places and not in others? And a, an important point to note is that these three different sort of ways of looking at things have very different implications for public policy. So thinking about sorting, um, we do know that there's differences in the propensity of people to move away in response to changes in pollution. And, uh, you know, whether that's preferences or whether that's constraints um, is not entirely clear, although I think probably uh, at least some of it is due to constraints. Uh, what this suggests is that we need to consider mobility as a possible reason for changes in racial gaps in pollution exposure. So, for example, if the gap closes, which it does, that could be because black people were moving to cleaner areas or that white people were moving to dirtier areas, and that would definitely close gaps even in the absence of any kind of pollution policy. Also, it could be that if you clean up a neighborhood, that that itself is related to changes in the racial composition of the neighborhood. And those kinds of um, changes in response to cleanups could tend to undo the effect of policy. So for example, if you clean up a Superfund site and the area becomes uh, more expensive, that might push the poor and minority people who were harmed originally by the hazardous waste site to uh, have to move away. So they might not benefit from the cleanup. Okay, so uh, talking about discrimination, there's two types of discrimination that are relevant. One is in labor markets, and this could affect the uh, earnings and wealth of families, which would constrain where they had the ability to live. And, and using the census data is going to help us to address this issue by allowing us to control for income, education, home ownership, and so on. And then there's also a lot of evidence of discrimination in housing markets. Um, a lot of it collected through audit studies where you send match controls to look at rentals or housing purchases. And this appears to play an important role independent of household income. The sort of bottom line from this literature is that it may not be easy for an African-American family to move to a, a predominantly white area, even if they can afford to do so. And then there's political economy considerations. Usually, um, the argument here is that local politics lead to decisions and zoning changes that privilege uh, powerful, wealthy, and probably wider neighborhoods over other neighborhoods. So the rich neighborhoods are more effective in blocking the siting of new pollution sources. 
So to the extent that regulations like the Clean Air Act target the dirtiest neighborhoods for cleanup, that may be a way to counteract the political economy process that, um, that disadvantages those neighborhoods. Okay, so turning to the data issues, what's the advantage of this high resolution data? Um, a big advantage is that it's there for every part of the country. Sparse monitoring data is an issue in many previous studies. There are some counties that have few or no monitors. Monitors also frequently go in and out of service, which can make it hard to get a time series. And as that map that I showed you showed, racial groups are not uniformly distributed within a county. So even if you have a measure for every county, that won't necessarily help you get a very precise measure of differences in pollution exposure by race. Okay. So this map is just showing where the PM 2.5 monitors are uh, in the US and uh, incidentally the darker colors are the places that have more PM 2.5. So you can see that there are many counties with no monitors and of course, the places that have the highest population do have monitors, but there are many parts of the country that are, you know, reasonably densely populated, such as in the south, that still have no monitors. That's for PM 2.5. It's only sort of relatively recently that the government started measuring 2.5, so you might wonder about other types of pollutants. Um, this map is showing that there are many counties that have no pollution monitors at all. Okay, so um, this is not a new problem and um, the, the government is aware of it and there has been a project by the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration to take all the available data from monitors, um, weather stations, information about fires and so on and use a model to come up with consistent county level data going back to the 1980s. Uh, and if you do that, you get a picture that looks something like this. This is for 2013. And so you can see the darker areas again are the areas with more PM 2.5 according to the MIRA model. Now, uh, researchers are producing data at a finer scale now and the data that we use was put together by D et al. Um, they do the same thing. They take all the available data, uh, impute data to places that don't have it, and then validate the data where they do have independent data from a monitor. Um, and what I'm going to show you is that these data produce a somewhat different spatial pattern and show pollution hotspots more clearly. So just comparing the MIRA data, which is on your left, to the um, new data, which is on the right, you can see that there's kind of a form of aggregation bias in the county level data, where you get um, you know, areas of the country, like say the Central Valley of California, um, looks when you do the county level aggregation like it's not that polluted, whereas one of it, it's one of the hotspots in the country. Okay, so you, I think you get a much more accurate view of where the pollution is by going finer. You can also hey, can look I, um, at- Can I just uh, ask a question? I, I, I saw like previous work on like monitors themselves being disproportionately placed in higher income, a lower proportion of minority, uh, Kind of areas of a county is do you guys find any evidence of that is that is that something that could be a concern in terms of just the monitors within a county being placed uh you know based on based on kind of income and uh, race yeah you know there's lots of stories about so that isn't really a focus of what we were doing we weren't trying to validate the, the satellite data with the monitor data but there's a lot of discussion about that and and some stories are the opposite um, I, you know, so one story is that you put the pollution monitor where you need it. So you, that would be in the area where you think that there's a lot of pollution. Another one would be, well, if I'm a county official and I really don't want to have pollution measures above the threshold, 
then I should put the monitor in the cleanest part of the county so that uh, it won't detect the, the places that are really polluted. So there's that uh, story as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be another reason why um, the monitor data would be kind of incomplete. Okay. I mean, I guess that's that's kind of an advantage of satellite uh, data, where if you're using monitor data, you might you might be subject to these biases, whereas satellite data, you're probably less likely to be biased in that way. I, I think that's right. Or you, you're less likely to be blind to uh, spots where there really is a lot of pollution. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks. So you can use this the data also to look at changes in pollution between 2000 and 2015, and that shows, um, I think, a fairly striking pattern where the eastern part of the U.S. is showing um, reductions and the western part is showing increases in, in some areas. Okay, so as I mentioned, we merged this pollution data to the census data. We're going to use individual level data from the 2000 census and then the American Community Survey, which is also run by the census Bureau, but it's a survey. And then we use the confidential data with census block identifiers and match the census block group centroid with the one kilometer by one kilometer pollution data and then match that to each individual in the data. So every person gets their own pollution measure from this uh, pollution data. Just a so, question on that, because what, what matter is is exposure, right, uh, to the pollutant. Uh, and I was wondering, I, I fully understand why you want to go like to, high, to really kind of high resolution here. But I was wondering, how do you know where people are in space and whether the one kilometer square is the right thing that you want to use or a slightly wider, uh, you know, perimeter to kind of, uh, you know, because people, you know, for example, I, I, I live in one part of the city and work in another one. So, I mean, what, what's the right pollution for me? Is it when, you know, at home or, or here at work. So does, does that make sense? I don't know if there yeah, is a big totally. benefit of, of going. It makes total sense. I mean, I think the way to think about these kinds of data, you know, so get, like what's the ideal pollution measure? And the epidemiologists really fight about this. So, you know, there's, there's one camp of epidemiologists who thinks that, well, what you really need is everybody should wear their personal backpack and measure their personal pollution level and that's the only way to get a meaningful measure of exposure. And that's certainly more accurate, but um, you know, so expensive that it's not really feasible to do that for a large sample. And then on the other hand, you have studies like this one where I'm looking at you know, potential exposure, not actual exposure, because I know where people live. I don't know where they work. I don't know how much time they spend at home. I don't know how airtight their windows are. I don't know whether they have air conditioning, <laughs> which would all be relevant in terms of their actual exposure to PM 2.5. Um, so in that sense, it's very noisy data, but it's very big data. Right? So there's a trade-off between having a really precise measure for a small sample and having a noisy measure for a big sample. And both of those can be meaningful, you know, depending on the study. So I, I think that's the best answer I can give about that. Um, so if you put all this data together and just say, okay, well, what were the trends in pollution over time? This is what you get. And so you can see that over the whole period that on average, white people are less exposed to PM 2.5 than black people, but the, um, you know, the gap narrows over time. And you can also see that the gap narrows a lot between 2005 and about 2009, right? And then kind of stays the same. So a lot, something was happening between 2005 and 2009. Okay. The first question that I'm going to ask is how much of this gap is explained by observables? And so in the census data, the observables that we have are race, gender, age, income, education. We know something about the family structure and also whether they own their own home. And there are 
large racial differences in these things on average. So you can see, for example, that black people are less likely to own their homes and also uh, have a lot lower income. So $34,000 on average compared to $50,000 on average. So there are these important differences, but um, they don't explain anything in terms of this gap. So what I've shown here on the left is the actual gap. So this is just taking the difference between those two lines that I showed you a minute ago. And then on the right hand side is the gap that remains after we control for uh, all those variables in the census data. So the point of putting these two things together is to show that you get almost exactly the same uh, pattern. Now, we think that's a, an important finding that, and in fact, I was very surprised because you would expect that, oh, you know, maybe the reason why black people are more exposed to pollution is because they're poorer on average, right? And so that figure is suggesting that it's not the case. Uh, so we kind of try and beat that up a little bit more. One way is to do um, Oaxaca blinder decomposition where we ask how much of the gap can be uh, explained by differences in the uh, X variables and how much is unexplained. So if you do that decomposition for 2000 and for 2015, um, this is what you get. The red bars are the explained part that's explained by differences in the characteristics. The blue bars are the part that is not explained. So clearly most of it is not explained by differences in characteristics. Okay. Uh, another fancier way to do that is to uh, reweight the African American distribution so that it has the same characteristics as the white distribution. And uh, again, that doesn't change uh, anything. And we can also look at uh, not just the cross-section in 2000 and in 2015, but the change between 2000 and 2015 and decompose that. And when we do that, again, not very much is explained by changes in characteristics over time. Okay, so that was focusing on the means. We can also look at the whole distribution. And if we look at the distribution of pollution exposure uh, for whites and blacks in 2000 and 2015, um, you can see the improvement over time. So I, I put a vertical line here at 10 micrograms per deciliter. Um, I think that's the right unit. Um, and you can see that in 2000, the distribution was mostly to the right of that. And in 2015, it's mostly to the left of that, showing big improvements in air quality. And also in terms of the racial gap, in 2000, black people are much more likely to be exposed to high levels. But in 2015, the two distributions are much more on top of each other. Okay. So... A second question one can ask, if it's not changes in people's characteristics, maybe it just reflects mobility patterns. So what this table is showing is the exposures in 2000, the exposures in 2015, and then a counterfactual which says, okay, if everybody had just stayed where they were in 2000, what would have uh, happened to the gap? Okay. And so looking at the, the bottom line here, the actual change in the gap is 1.02. The counterfactual is 0.89. Okay. So the difference between those implies that only about 12.7% of the closure of the gap is due to mobility. Okay. Looking at... Uh, sort of in more detail at the mobility question, we can say, okay, so there was some moving around. Who was moving and where were they moving to? Uh, so one way to look at that is by looking at the covariance between the air quality in the uh, census tract 
and the share African American or the share white. Okay, so if, for example, blacks were moving to cleaner areas, then it would be the case that the covariance between African American and black uh, went up over time. Okay, but you see that that line is pretty flat, indicating that on average, black people were not moving to cleaner or dirtier areas. Um, the line for whites is interesting because it's upward sloping. So what that suggests is that on average, whites were moving to dirtier areas. So this actually reflects the uh, sort of revival of central cities, like people moving to Manhattan, which is more polluted. And it was mostly white people who were doing that over this period of time. So some of the closure of the gap is actually due to white people moving to dirtier areas. Okay, so um, having kind of ruled out changes in characteristics and changes in mobility as major explanations, I'm now going to talk a little bit about the Clean Air Act. Uh, and just to review, it's the largest U.S. environmental program. It sets air quality standards for what are called criterion air pollutants, which include uh, PM. It's administered at the county by pollutant by year level. So every year, the EPA looks at whether the uh, county is exceeding the target, and counties that exceed the air quality threshold are designated as being in non-attainment. Firms that are in non-attainment counties are then subject to limits on admissions, uh, they might be required to use certain abatement technologies, or they might be uh, required to purchase offsets that reduce pollution elsewhere in the county. New standards for PM 2.5 were, were proposed originally in 1997, but the implementation was delayed for eight years by um, court challenges. They were very contentious. In uh, April 2005, the EPA's designation of 205 counties in 20 states for non-attainment of these 1997 national air quality standards finally became effective. Uh, so an interesting thing about this is there, there wasn't really new information revealed in April 2005. Everybody knew that these counties were out of attainment with these new standards. It just wasn't clear if and when the new standards would ever be enforced. So implementation of these new standards offers an opportunity to look at the impact of these tougher pollution regulations. And uh, again, since African Americans lived in the most polluted places, then one would expect that unless the impact of the regulations was undone by resorting across areas, the tougher regulations would have the greatest impact on uh, potential exposure by African Americans. So this map is showing which, you know, where these 205 counties were. You can see they're, they're mostly in the east and then in California. Um, Nothing, unfortunately, in the Midwest, so uh, they're not really part of our um, natural experiment here. You can see that counties uh, that had higher pollution, that were in the higher pollution quantiles, were more likely to be designated in non-attainment. So that's what the rules say, so that's what you would expect. And uh, doing an event study, you see that um, there's sort of maybe very slow decline in pollution prior to 2005, and then a large reduction from 2005 to 2009, which corresponds exactly to the narrowing of that racial gap, and then a pretty flat um, trend in PM 2.5 after 2009. Looking at this in a difference in difference framework, we can um, you know, control for county, control for um, year fixed effects, 
and look at this interaction between being in a non-attainment place and being post uh, April 2005. And when we do that, we again see large effects of being in non-attainment on subsequent PM 2.5. We can also look at whether that is different for um, black individuals compared to white individuals, and we don't really see uh, a difference here in the difference in difference. Janet? Yeah. Could I ask you a question about um, you know, the really interesting finding that you just showed a few slides ago, um, namely white people moving to more polluted places. Um, so that made me wonder about how salient this pollution is to people generally. And sort of like one reason that I'm thinking about this is you know, just looking at a more global perspective. Um, I think annual PM 2.5 concentrations in the US would be about 10, 15. Um, I mean, I'm, I've looked at maps in India and the annual concentrations would be about 150. And you know, these are like correlated with many other things and you can probably see at the, at the 150 level that there is pollution. Um, yeah, so just wondering what you think the mechanism is, like are people just, you know, white people who are richer do not understand that any level of pollution is bad or is it that New York is just very attractive? Well, I think it would be the latter, right? I mean, London is very polluted, <laughs> but many people live there, even though they know that it's very polluted. I think London consistently exceeds the air quality standards in the UK. Um, I think India is an interesting case. I, I was there a few years ago and um, was staying in a hotel in Delhi and I literally couldn't see the other side of the road. The air quality was so terrible. And I kept asking people about it. It's like, oh, the, the pollution is terrible. And they'd say, oh, no, there's just fog at this time of year. <laughs> it's like everyone seemed to be in complete denial. Um, but I understand now people have become more educated about it and are more ready to recognize that it's a problem. Although I don't know if very many of them are moving out of Delhi because of it. Yeah. So anyway, we know that white people are moving like Manhattan. Uh, there, it had all sorts of other interesting effects. Life expectancy in Manhattan went up hugely, you know, uh, and that's just because young, healthy people were moving there, um, not because as the Bloomberg administration liked to take credit for it, you know, because of their tobacco policies or their um, healthy food policies, <laughs> that probably wasn't what was driving the life expectancy increase. It could also be that they were um, taking some sort of evasive, like some sort of measures to, you know, exposure is not the same thing as actual. Um, you know, That's true. You can mitigate to a, some extent, although PM 2.5 does come inside. Um, okay, so, um, I've been saying that um, black people were more likely to be in the high pollution places. And this is a, a figure that shows that. So here we're looking at um, vantiles of the pollution distribution. And the blue bars here are, are for white people. And you can see they're a little bit more likely to be in the least polluted places and less likely to be in the most polluted places, it's fairly even distribution across places. That is not the case for black people where they're very unlikely to be in the least polluted places and much more likely than white people to be in the most polluted places. Okay? So there's clearly a lot of scope for regulations that affected people in the upper quantiles to have a disproportionately positive impact on black people. So looking at how the Clean Air Acts affects different parts of the distribution, we use these recentered influence function methods. Um, so essentially what you do with these methods is to uh, first transform the outcome variable using the recentered influence function and then use this recentered variable the way that you would use um, any other variable. So you can project it on the explanatory variables and ask how much of the observed 
uh, characteristics explain pollution at the different um, percentiles of the pollution distribution, for example. Okay, so the key um, fact about a recentered influence function is that even after you've done this transformation, if you take the expectation, you get back the quantile that you're interested in. You know, so that's why you can use something like a Oaxaca blinder decomposition to decompose this RAF statistic. Okay, so using this in our difference in difference estimates, we can come up with an estimate for each uh, quantile of the distribution. And so what this is showing is that these two 2005 Clean Air Act standards had very little effect at the bottom of the distribution of pollution, which you would expect because they didn't apply there. They have a quite large effect around the middle of the distribution, and then the effects actually get somewhat smaller at the highest levels of pollution. And for the very highest, they're not statistically significant when we look at everybody together. However, if we do this separately for blacks and whites, we get a little bit more nuanced picture. Now we're still finding the largest effects in the middle of the distribution, but now for the most polluted quantiles, we're seeing a negative effect for African Americans in the most polluted places, but not for whites. And I think what that reflects is that uh, within counties, remember counties are the units where the Clean Air Act is applied. Uh, what we saw earlier was that black people and white people live in different parts. So if in the county we apply the Clean Air Act, it may not have any effect on the white population, but it could have a large effect on the black population because they're living in the most polluted part of the county. So coming back to this mobility issue then, we can also ask how do the racial shares in each quantile change with these uh, Clean Air Act regulations? So what these figures have is along the x-axis, it's the estimated treatment effect, and along the y-axis is the change in the population share. On the left, it's the black population share, and on the right, it's the white population share between 2005 and 2015, so after these Clean Air Act um, amendments went into effect. Okay, so what this is showing is that uh, black, the, the change in the black population share was lower in the places that had the biggest pollution declines. And conversely, for whites, the population share was higher. Okay, so what this is showing is that these movements tended to undo the effects of the Clean Air Act. Now, you may ask, how is this consistent with the earlier thing about whites moving to Manhattan? So what I think it's showing is that if you take um, whites moving to urban areas, they are moving to urban areas, so they're getting more pollution on average. But when choosing urban areas, they're choosing the ones that had the biggest improvements in air quality. Okay, so those two things are not inconsistent and suggests that maybe people do care about this when they're choosing to move. Because if I'm choosing between cities, I'm going to choose the one that had the biggest air quality improvement. We can also use these estimates to ask what fraction of the racial convergence is explained by the differential effects of the Clean Air Act across quantiles, uh, given the mobility responses that we see. So to do that, we take these um, estimates of the effects of the Clean Air Act, combine them with the population shares, and compute a counterfactual pollution level in the absence of the policy. So this sort of uh, small and busy table does that. We show the actual PM 2.5 exposure in 2005 for each quantile, the actual in 2015 for each quantile, and then we have a white counterfactual 
that is what would be the exposure without the policy, a black counterfactual, again, what would be the exposure without the policy, and then um, the sort of bottom line is in this red box here where we say, okay, the actual change in the black-white gap was negative 0.59, the counterfactual without the policy would have been negative 0.23, and so um, doing the calculation, that suggests that 61% of the decline in the actual change was due to the Clean Air Act. Okay, so just to, to conclude, we use the nationwide satellite data to document the racial gap in PM2.5. We show that the gap narrowed substantially, that little of the gap is explained by changes in personal characteristics or movements of African Americans away from polluted places. Uh, like there was a lot more white mobility than black mobility basically and I think this may reflect a, that the segregation in the housing markets is really due to discrimination and not choices of people with different income levels for instance. Because African Americans are more likely to live in polluted places, enforcement of the Clean Air Act is shown to explain over 60% of the reduction in pollution exposure gaps between 2000 and 2015. And then, um, so those are sort of the narrow conclusions of our study. The implications and questions for future research, uh, I think, flow from that. In this example, we showed that policies targeting the dirtiest areas furthered racial justice, even though they don't take explicit account of race. Uh, because black people are more likely to stay in historically black neighborhoods, which is in part due to discrimination, sorting did not undo the environmental justice effects of place-based targeting. Um, it did a little bit but certainly not entirely. So I think this begs the question of to what extent and under what conditions do general environmental policies provide a win both for the environment and for environmental justice. So I'll, I'll stop there and I'm happy to take any questions in the remaining five minutes. Janet, um, this is Ludovica. I really uh, like this paper, you know, I've, I've seen it before. I, I, I want to take up this, this last question that you have here and sort of ask you whether you think that uh, in terms of political economy, uh, sort of policies that are broad in mandate and that, you know, are national standards, for example, uh, do you think can further EJ better than instead more targeted policies? where uh, you know one could you know there could be there could start being fights you know as in which neighborhood needs to be cleaned sooner rather than later or where and where you know the color of, of the of the residents or the socioeconomic status of the residents might matter yes um you know this is a really controversial issue and i think a lot of people would like to see explicitly race-based policies to make up for past and current, um, you know, structural racism. Um, and then I think it really is a political economy question and presumably one with an empirical answer, whether that works better or whether the general policy that um, doesn't explicitly hinge on race, but will have a disproportional impact on black people is more likely to actually become policy, right? So I think we have a lot of examples of environmental policies that have uh, benefited historically underprivileged groups disproportionately. Um, and yeah. I think you're asking exactly the right question. It's like, are those policies more likely to get passed? Uh, and that would be a really interesting thing to look at. If I could jump in, um, Janet, interesting presentation. I, I'm sort of taking the conclusion here, 
I'm imagining some of my colleagues here who are very active in environmental justice at Yale. And, and one of the takeaways that they might say from this is these are, this is a, a great finding and helpful, but maybe the environmental justice issue now is actually the lack of enforcement of the Clean Air Act. So you're showing that the enforcement that we've had so far has helped, but what about all those places that are not in attainment right now? And I'm wondering if you could actually quantify what the gains in justice would actually be if all the areas were in compliance with the Clean Air Act. Oh yeah, that's a great idea. You know, um, the other thing is that we sort of end at 2015 and then of course in 2016, <laughs> we had a new administration and the reversal of many environmental policies. And um, you saw actually quite rapid increases in PM 2.5 after that point and presum you know, presumably the unraveling of uh, a lot of these gains. Um, and unfortunately, even though you'd like a new administration to come in and wave a magic wand and make everything the way it was before, it seems to take time to do that. Um, so I think, yeah, I, that's a great idea that you had and we should definitely try and do that. Um, and I also think, you know, what's happened in the last five years is a, is a, another interesting experiment that could be added onto this to show the reverse process at, at work. Right, we, we have uh, two or three more minutes. So if uh, anyone has uh, another question, uh, this is really the right time uh, to do so. If not, I, I will ask a question because I have, I have quite a few, uh, but I want to, to give you the opportunity. All right, I'll ask away. So uh, Janet, I was wondering, uh, I, think, I think I saw one or two papers, but how much do we know about how these uh, changes translate into health and, and other benefits uh, more, more, more broadly, this kind of, uh, you know, kind of closing the gap between these uh, two populations? Right. Um... Because, because I think about two things, right? Because again, I'm going back to exposure and I'm thinking about the health implication. And yes, one is, is how much you expose, but the second is how sensitive you are to this exposure. And we're also talking about mitigating kind of options that people can buy different equipment. And we were talking about white people moving into Manhattan, but they can invest in, 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 you know, in air purifiers and things like that. So what, what do we know yeah. about that? Yeah, I think that's true. In principle, I think people, there's not that much work doing this that I'm aware of, but um, there is some work trying to look at, say, are health effects different for whites and blacks? For example, they might be worse for black people if black people are less likely to be able to take mitigation measures. Um, I think for air pollution, I haven't seen a whole lot of evidence that it's worse. Um, so that means that you could take kind of the off-the-shelf estimates of what is the effect of PM 2.5 on mortality risk among the elderly, hospitalizations, um, infant mortality, and apply them to this data to, to say what would be the improvement in health. Um, I guess why I always sort of hesitate to do that because it's not quite clear how you should add that up. You know, um, economists like to boil it all down to dollars, which then horribly offends everybody else <laughs> when you're talking about putting a value of, uh, of a life. But it does really facilitate adding up uh, across these disparate outcomes. But yeah, you could definitely do that. And that would be a good thing to do. I was going to follow up on that in terms of the age distribution. Yeah, I mean, the, the anecdotal story was young white people moving to Manhattan, even though they're exposed to more pollution, it's unlikely to in fact impact them as much as, say, an older black person who lived in, who lives in Manhattan the whole time. Is there this kind of evidence that if you do the age gap or the racial gap by age, 
there is um is it still um kind of um the gap is short uh, what, what am i saying that gap is uh not widening the gap is shortening oh you know we haven't done it by age so i i don't know what the answer to that is um one reason i think that the the literature about cognitive effects of pollution is really interesting is because that is looking more at prime age people so you know the the um the paper about Wall Street people making worse trades on high pollution days, for example, those are presumably young, healthy people who are still being affected by the, the higher pollution. So it provides some window on that um, at sort of a finer level than just looking at whether people end up in the hospital. So. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much uh, again for uh, uh, for presenting in a workshop, uh, really great presentation. Uh, I'm gonna stop recording now. Uh, I hope that that's fine.